Okay, my name is Aniko Magashazi and I am uh, the organizer at IASC as a researcher here of the uh, Future of Europe in a Global uh, Context Lecture Series since the beginning of the 2018. And uh, beforehand, I would like to very briefly introduce Chris Hahn, so I cannot list all these uh, uh, medals and merits. Uh, he graduated in Oxford first with a BA and that was a time when you came to Hungary and Poland for a field work in the rural areas uh, of Hungary and had a PhD uh, from Cambridge in social anthropology. And afterwards you were researched and, uh, and, and uh, uh, taught in different universities in England and Germany. But I still would like to highlight that uh, uh, Professor Hahn is a fellow of the Corpus Christi College in Cambridge and then ordinarily has mid lead of the Berlin Bardenburg Academy of Sciences. And one last comment that uh, I think it was on 18th of December 2019, when uh, Professor Hahn was presented with the Huxley Medal, the most important medal that the Royal Anthropological Institute, the world's oldest anthropological associate, can bestow. So, uh, first of all, I would like to ask uh, Professor uh, Mislivets uh, uh, for uh, a few words from the side of our institution. And please uh, turn on your mic. <laughs> please unmute your mic. <laughs> it's a bit difficult. Because it's hard to find. This, yeah, I, or we already had a chat is and I probably told everyone that we have been um, colleagues and friends for a long, long time. We know each other since the mid eighties or, or I don't know, even earlier. And, and I knew him in his capacity as a, as a, as a fantastically interesting researcher, anthropological research in a small Hungarian um, city, a village, Tazla, and also in, in, in Poland, in a small village. And I was very happy, but then I also knew his work about civil society, which we have been using and teaching, etc., for decades. And I was very happy when I saw his book and his suggestion to, to connect Polanyi, to repatriate Polanyi, Karl Polanyi, um, uh, to, to the issue of civil society and, and uh, Hungarian mainstream research. So I don't want to take the time. Maybe we have time for, for commenting and discussing later. I would like to rather ask Chris to, to start this talk. Welcome, Chris. As Institute of Advanced Studies, as probably you noticed, new institute in Kursag. We are about celebrating our fifth anniversary soon, of course, online. Um, but we very much hope that you will come and visit us as it was planned during the summer and the fall. COVID time did not allow us to meet personally, but um, it's going to happen, I'm, I'm sure. So you are always welcome in Kursag. So. Floor is yours. Thank you very much for these introductions. I always feel uncertain, even embarrassed, when I'm talking about Karl Polanyi to an audience in Hungary. It's a little bit like carrying coals to Newcastle, as we say in my native Britain. But that is what I want to do in the next half hour. I am grateful to all of you in Kursek for this invitation, especially to your Polanyi research unit. At the beginning and at the end of my talk, I want to touch on some biographical details, but the main part of this talk will involve applications of some key concepts of Karl Polanyi to understanding and explaining recent developments in Hungary. By recent, I mean the last 70 years. So I'm going to be concerned with the socialist decades as well as post-socialist experiences. My first section is titled Young Lawyers with a Taste for Politics. So I want to begin by reaching still further back into the past. Late 19th century Hungary was the junior partner in a significant imperial formation. Hungarian society in that time can be characterized as quite strongly nationalist and overwhelmingly conservative. Indeed, it was still semi-feudal outside the major urban centers. 
Yet, by the 1900s, some new developments were underway, most conspicuously in the capital, Budapest. The young Karl Polanyi was a student of law, but his interests ranged widely from Russian and English literature to contemporary politics. The secretary of the Galilei Circle was both a gifted orator and a conscientious organizer of like-minded students. Polanyi paid a price for his provocations. He was banished to provincial Kolozhvar to complete his studies. Soon afterwards, his life course was transformed by the First World War, and this was followed by a series of exiles that took him ever further away from his birthplace. Let me invite you now to compare and contrast the life course of Karl Polanyi with that of another young Hungarian lawyer with rhetorical skills and a taste for politics roughly 80 years later. In Hungary in the late 1980s, an entrenched social order was rapidly losing its hold. It was opening up new spaces for many kinds of radical voice. Whatever you may think about his charisma, it seems to me that Viktor Orban's dedication in those years, late eight, 1980s, his organizational skills were even more impressive than those of the young Karl Polanyi. Unlike Polanyi, Orban was never expelled from university and he completed his studies on time. He never worked as a lawyer. The equivalent of the cataclysm of 1914 was the end of socialist domination in 1989, and the rest is history. I will return to this comparison at the end of this talk. First of all, let me give you some basic Polanyan concepts with apologies to those of you who know this material already very well and in much greater depth. I'm going to be very brief and superficial. I want to give you the four principles of economic behavior as they were identified by Karl Polanyi in his magnum opus, The Great Transformation, 1944. First, there is reciprocity, which is generally horizontal, symmetrical movements. For example, between the moieties of non-industrial society, tribes, such as we find in Melanesia. This is often described nowadays in terms of mutuality. It's certainly more than what the economist understands as tit for tat. That is the way the economist understands reciprocity. Polanyi's understanding is much deeper. Secondly, there is redistribution, which occurs when goods move into a center and are redistributed from that center by some power figure. Could be a tribal chief, or it could be a welfare state that taxes its citizens in order to fund government expenditure. Then there is the principle of householding, which drops out when Polanyi reformulates this scheme, the heuristic, if you wish. He reformulates it in 1957 in a famous article and householding drops out, so only three forms of integration remain. But in 1944, householding was still important. It originates in the Aristotelian notion of the oikos, the house or the estate that aspires to be self-sufficient on the basis of the labor, the contributions of its members. Now, the household is very seldom self-sufficient in practice. This is an ideal, not a reality. Perhaps the key criterion is that the household as a unit is both the main unit of production and simultaneously the unit of consumption, as in the archetypal peasant household of East Central Europe. Finally, there is exchange, by which Polanyi refers to market exchange. He doesn't use the word market as often as you might expect in the Great Transformation. Market exchange is not to be confused with the presence of local markets as an ancillary form of economic behavior from the ancient Greeks onwards. Polanyi argues 
that these markets are always subordinate to other principles of integration. They're not price forming markets, he says. They are subject to political controls, to a range of customary restrictions, perhaps even religious and cosmological factors. That's how Polanyi begins to approach market in the typology that he offers in the Great Transformation. Another key Polanyi concept that I will come back to is that of the counter movement, which refers to a movement of self-protection grounded deep in society which is the inevitable consequence of promoting the principle of market exchange to be a dominant principle of economic behavior. Polanyi believed that the ideology of 19th century laissez-faire, the utopia of what he called the self-regulating market, was the root cause of the catastrophes of 20th century history. But this was not a simple, not a teleological process. The enhanced power of markets generated what he called a double movement and the outcomes in practice were complex. They could include very benign reforms, such as the establishment of trade unions, the spread of employment insurance schemes. They would be benign forms of the counter movement, but the counter movement could also be malignant. It could plunge countries and whole regions into world war and that happened twice in the first half of the 20th century a third idea from polanyi i've given you the principles of economic behavior four of them i've mentioned the counter movement let me also say a word about embedding polanyi used this metaphor from time to time not very often not as often as you might think given the prominence of the later literature around this idea of embedding. Polanyi didn't use it that often, but it seemed to convey his philosophy of history. Probably it originated in the work of Richard Thurnwald, an Austrian ethnographer who Polanyi read carefully in the 1930s when he was preparing his notes for the Great Transformation. Thurnwald is quoted a lot in chapter four of this magnum opus and in the appendices. In tribal economies, such as those that Tornwald studied in Melanesia at the same time as Malinowski, the economy is embedded in society. This is also true of all other human societies prior to 19th century Britain, when the economy becomes, for the first time, disembedded. This leads to the counter movement that I just mentioned. The question is then how to resolve these contradictions by accomplishing some form of re-embedding. Many commentators have suggested that this happened in the form of expanding welfare states after 1945 in the context of Keynesian social democracy. Some people call this phase embedded liberalism. But Karl Polanyi himself did not think that the underlying problems could be resolved by the mix of the Western world in the second half of the 20th century. Not even Scandinavian welfare states attracted Polanyi. Rather, he pinned his hopes on the Soviet Union and a democratization of socialism. Now, my next section, I'm going to be empirical from now on. I don't want this talk to remain abstract and theoretical. I do try to keep up to date with at least some of the academic literature on Hungary in anthropology and in other social sciences, including the macro level investigations of sociologists and political economists. But my perspective has always been influenced and you might say distorted by field work in the interfluvial area between the Danube and the Tisa, south of Budapest. After nearly half a century, this is still the only part of Hungary that I keep going back to in order to track the latest changes. So let me start in the 1970s. I visited Budapest for the first time in 1972, thanks to an interrail ticket. I went back again in the summer of 1974 after completing a BA and I obtained a diploma after successfully completing a summer university in economics 
at what was then called the Karl Marx University for Economic Science. In 1974, I managed to travel around a little bit outside the capital city. After switching to anthropology for graduate studies, it was Jack Goody, my professor in Cambridge, who encouraged me to follow up my developing interest in East Europe. I therefore dropped my aspirations to go to New Guinea and prepared a project to investigate how decentralization and other aspects of the new economic mechanism were playing out in rural Hungary. I found some studies in English in geographical journals, which indicated that the sandy zone between the two major rivers would be a suitable location for field work. Thanks to an official exchange program, I was able to spend the years 1975 to 1977 in Hungary, including the best part of a year in Tazla, which in those days was an outlying settlement in the district of Kishkörösh. I was affiliated to the ethnographic research group at the Academy in Budapest. I wrote up my PhD back in Cambridge, defended it in 1979, and my first book was published early in 1980 about the village of Tazla. Now, you will not find any mention of Polanyi in either my dissertation or my book. Shame on me. I knew the name from the introductory courses I had taken in Cambridge, and I taught the basics of his substantivist economic anthropology to undergraduates myself as a junior lecturer in the 1980s. But during this period, Polanyi's star had faded. He was out of fashion, mainly due to the popularity of neo-Marxist approaches. I can vaguely recall agreeing with Mihai Sharkan, my main advisor at the Academy Research Group, that for all his merits and his brilliance, Karl Polanyi did not engage adequately with productive systems. And so the critiques of scholars such as Maurice Godelli in Paris were entirely justified. I have tried to make amends for this neglect of Polanyi in more recent work, especially in the book that I published last year, which brings together a selection of papers published since the demise, written and published since the demise of the socialist regimes. Very quickly, let me explain now how I think I should have applied the toolkit of Karl Polanyi in the 1970s. I view the 1970s and 80s as an era of what I would now call embedded socialism. It was embedded in the sense that the institutions I analyzed in Tazla comprised a balance of all four of the principles identified by Karl Polanyi in 1944. Reciprocity was very conspicuous in mutual aid for house building, Kolaka. Webs of reciprocity were evident in many other activities, such as the organizing of wedding parties, winter pig killings, but also in small scale farming, where farmers had to cooperate with each other, especially at harvest time. So reciprocity was important, but of course, redistribution mattered as well. This principle was evident in the subsidy which the local collective farm received to compensate for the unfavorable ecological conditions of this region, at least unfavorable for arable farming, not so unfavorable for fruit and for vineyards. More generally, of course, the socialist states in the 1970s continued to control many prices, foreign trade, and also what you might call the terms of trade between rural and urban sectors. The state had not gone away Large state investments were enabling huge improvements to infrastructure in places like Tazla. By the time of my first field research, even areas of scattered Tonya settlement were being added to the electricity grid. It was a period of both private and public consolidation, accumulation. State aid facilitated investment in new factories in nearby Kishkun Holash and new workshops in Tazlar itself, so that wage labor opportunities were readily available to virtually the entire population. Market exchange 
was also of great importance by the middle of the 1970s. There was no denying the increased significance of price signals. I could see this during field work when the price offered for pigs, the hazel, that was the key term. What was the price of your hazel? If it was not raised every year in line with inflation, then villagers could opt not to produce these animals through their extra labor in their backyards. And if they responded by going on strike, then the government was pretty sure to raise the price the following year because the government needed that meat coming from the small farm sector. During this period, consumer markets were improving dramatically. But I would draw attention, I did in my published work, to the fact that it was also possible to acquire tractors privately in the 1970s. And by the late 1980s, Tazla had its first private owners of very large machines, combine harvesters, which in theory in a socialist state, well, you could ask questions about that, but that illustrates the flexibility of this so-called market socialism in the 1970s and the 1980s. This flexibility was based above all on the fourth of Polanyi's four principles, namely householding. This I see as the key to so much of the prosperity of those decades of so-called goulash socialism in the Hungarian provinces. Tazla was characterized by a distinctive form of collective farm known as the Soxevet Gazette. The essence of this was that because of the distinctive ecology, the patchwork of farms and vineyards across the landscape, nominal collectivization in 1961 did not in practice mean having to work for an organization based on the Soviet kolkhoz. Most households in Tazla continued to cultivate the plots which they had owned in pre-socialist decades. Admittedly, the Soxovet Gazette was not representative of the socialist countryside, but at the other end of the spectrum, state farms, such as the one I have been studying more recently in Kishkun Halash, even the state farm, where all property is owned by the state, not by the collective locally, but by the state, even state farms afforded scope to their workers to produce commodities for sale on their own use plots for the market. It is no exaggeration, I think, to say that the rapidly modernizing peasant household was the key institution in the relative success of Hungarian agriculture in the last decades of socialism. So this is embedded socialism for me. I think it can be theorized in terms of a counter movement. Now that might not seem intuitively plausible. What do I mean by that? Obviously the embourgeoisement, which Ivan Seleni and others as well as myself documented in the last decades of socialism did not resemble Polanyi's double movement which involves the self-protection of society against laissez-faire. But you could argue that disembedding might just as well be occasioned by an exaggerated application of the principle of redistribution. The classic disembedding is caused by an extreme version of the market principle. And I'm playing with this heuristic and suggesting what happened in the 1950s was another kind of disembedding in which Stalinist redistribution was pursued to an inhumane extreme. And what we witness from the early 1960s onwards is a gentle counter movement that privileges market elements rather than the self-protection of society as formulated by Polanyi. It's another kind of counter movement. Under these circumstances, the counter movement to re-establish balance consists in a steady enhancement of the market principle and not its extirpation. In the agricultural sector, this counter movement began in effect with the very formation of the collective farms in 1960 and 1961. Later, the creative agency of reformist socialists was crucial. Not many members of the Socialist Party understood the rural sector very well. But Lajos Fehir, minister, and Ferenc Erdély pulling strings behind the scenes, these were two reformed socialist politicians of the 1960s 
who were enormously influential even before the official introduction of the new economic mechanism in 1968. So much for embedded socialism. My next section deals with the first post-socialist decades. So the 1990s and the 2000s. Everything that I've described up to now fell apart rapidly after 1990, thanks to the enthusiasm of the new power holders for privatizing almost everything. And of course, also because of the impossibility for the new economic actors to compete efficiently on Western, on international markets. My crude label for these two decades is neoliberal disembedding. It is important to note the insidious spread of a neoliberal ideology in the 1980s, especially among the economists. The common assumption was that all the limited measures to expand the market principle in Hungary since the 1960s were doomed to failure. They were inadequate half measures. And so the new generation of economists was convinced that in place of further compromises or simulation of the market, you had to have the real thing. There was almost a consensus that only a combination of rigorous private property rights and genuinely free markets would ease the economic tensions of Hungary in the 1980s. This, in essence, is what happened after the Rense Baltash, when collective property was sold off and the country was opened up to foreign capital. Ironically, the main agents of neoliberalism, among the major agents in these two decades of disembedded neoliberalism, you find the former Socialist Party, the former Communist Party, now called the Socialist Party, who collaborated so enthusiastically with international agencies to privatize everything they possibly could, while at the same time struggling to maintain as much as they could of welfare state transfers when they wanted to win elections. So they were in an impossible contradiction. These contradictions accumulated over two decades. They culminated in the global financial crisis and the election of Viktor Orban as prime minister for the second time at the head of a fides cad NP coalition in 2010. I want to consider these two decades of post-socialism, again with the help of Polanyi's concepts, and again privileging the worm's eye view from my location in the danube tisa interfluke. Let me take reciprocity and householding together. Inter-household cooperation for house building died away very quickly because nobody wanted to build any new houses. Large wedding parties also went out of fashion. So did the winter pig killings, especially after new German supermarkets made meat available at a price much lower than the costs of raising an animal in the traditional way in your backyard. Small shops could not compete. With the elimination of special subsidies, farmers had even greater difficulty than households elsewhere in establishing capitalized commercial enterprises. Many of those who claimed land when the collective institutions were dismantled were never in a position to use it efficiently. In addition to the enormous economic costs, many households that I knew well in those years, they suffered emotionally, even traumas in those long years of decollectivization. Unemployment was even more of a problem in the urban sector because very little survived of the industry that was built up in Kishkun Holash by socialist power holders from the 1960s onwards. The town has a significant Roma population, about 8% perhaps of the population. Most of these Roma held unskilled jobs at the state farm during the final decades of socialism. They were not the only ones to face unemployment after 1990. Perhaps in some ways, the Roma adapted more readily than their Hungarian co-citizens who were less familiar with some of the darker recesses of the informal economy. Many young Hungarians started in the 1990s to look for jobs in Western labor markets, even before such migration became fully legal after EU accession in 2004. Some household economies have become quite dependent on remittances, 
since then. In many cases, however, the young migrants do not actually earn enough money washing dishes in London to send money home to their parents and grandparents. Their visits tend to become less frequent as the years go by. I have not come across any cases in the village or in the town in which wealth accumulated abroad is reinvested to start a business back in the homeland. That variation doesn't seem to exist in the locations that I'm familiar with. Let me say a word about redistribution in these decades, which certainly provided a degree of alleviation of economic suffering. Welfare provision persisted. Indeed, it remained excessive, according to the arguments of some economists, at least relative to the country's general economic capacity. That was the position of Janusz Kornai. I don't know if he ever qualified those opinions. As far as I know, he did not. And he thought that more severe cuts should have been made in welfare spending in that period. But he did not interact with households in the way that I did in Tazlar and Kishkun Halash. Many key areas that had benefited from socialist redistribution experienced structural changes, some of which brought new kinds of suffering even. Because along with the restitution of property, educational responsibilities were shifted away from the state to the churches. The inhabitants of Kishkun Halash were proud of the vast six-story hospital that the socialists opened in the 1970s, which provided excellent medical care for quite a large region of southern Hungary. And that hospital is still there today, but its temporary privatization under the socialist government of Ferenc Gyurcsán was regarded as a scandal and caused great bitterness to medical staff and to citizens alike because it seemed to be calling into question a fundamental principle of redistribution, the damage done to the hospital in the 2010s. So that episode, that hospital episode, epitomizes the anomie of those decades in which, as I see it, the Hayekian logic of private property and market were the dominant economic principles. Obviously, this was quite unlike the British case explored by Polanyi in the first century of industrialization in Britain. The basic difference is that the Hungarian population in places like Tazlar and Kishkun Halash has made considerable progress down a path of embourgeoisement, socialist embourgeoisement, to take Seleni's famous title. These people had long been familiar with high standards of education and universal health care, not to mention full employment. So when all of these were called into question in these decades of disintegration, I think it's intuitively obvious that social worlds are falling apart in every possible way. And when the political party traditionally identified with defending the interests of working people seems in practice to betray those interests, then the form of the counter movement becomes predictable. If there is no candidate, nobody qualified to organize a counter movement on the left, then the counter movement will take a different form. It will gravitate to the right. So my next section deals with the 2010s. I'm going to be very brief now. Uh, no, yes, the 2010s. And here my argument is really quite simple, that in the last decade, we have seen a new equilibrium in places like Tazla and Kishkun Halash. And this equilibrium can be theorized as a form of re-embedding, to use Polanyi's metaphor. This counter movement did not emerge overnight, certainly not in 2010. Its proximate origins can be traced back at least to Orban's defeat at the hands of Gyurcsán in, 20, in 2002. Having in the mid 1990s already shifted Fidesz to the right in order to secure the votes of smallholders and the NDF in the 1990s, Orban continued his shift to the right and conservative nationalist messages were embraced ever more emphatically after his election defeat in 2002. 
Of course, Fidesz was by no means the most extreme in these years. So we must remember they witnessed also the first flowering of Jobbik, which is a party, incidentally, that still commands strong local support in Kishkun Halosh. In short, the counter-movement to the market-induced disruption of the first post-socialist decades is reactionary rather than progressive. Orban himself has characterized his politics as illiberal in 2014, in that famous speech in Transylvania. He has profited enormously from the migrant crisis of 2015, and he continues to maintain a very high political temperature through campaign scapegoating liberals in Brussels, not to mention George Soros. Here, I must restrict myself to a brief consideration of economic aspects, again, using the terms deployed by Polanyi. Reciprocity and householding. I would say that no significant changes have taken place here in the last decade, but, but households continue to languish. Kishkun Holash has established a rotary club, but there is no real scope for small businesses to flourish in this town of less than 30,000 inhabitants nowadays. Many households struggle to get by on meager pensions. They cannot afford to shop in Tesco or Aldi, but purchase from itinerant traders, from Chinese discount stores, and quite a few of them queue up for their basic food supply at soup kitchens. What about redistribution? Social security transfers to individuals declined dramatically after 2010 under the new Fidesz-led government. But the town's hospital is again fully public and nobody is asking questions about its future at the moment. Local government commands very few resources because almost everything is centralized. The local politicians depend on competitive payasot applications to the center. For this reason alone, it would hardly be rational to vote for other than a Fidesz candidate as your member of parliament or as your mayor, local councillor. Across the country, the state has become much more interventionist than it was in the first post-socialist decades. But there have been no significant cases of renationalizing land in this area. Interventions in the labor market, by contrast, have been very conspicuous, as they are everywhere in Hungary. The workfare schemes that originated in socialist ideas before 2010 were massively expanded under Viktor Orban in the last decade. While most foreign commentators denounce workfare as the punitive face of neoliberalism, I found much praise for these measures among citizens of Tazlar and Kishkun Holash, including participants in the workfare schemes themselves. Much of the work that people are asked to carry out as Kuzmul Kashuk is very boring, sometimes pointless, and the remuneration is below the official minimum wage. But this work confers social security and pension rights. And above all, it ensures that the long-term unemployed have to get out of their house early in the morning and set a different example to their children from the pattern of the previous 20 years. This aspect was particularly stressed when people talked to me about Roma families in their town. And the minority deputy mayor of Kishkun Halash argues that his people, the Roma, were the main victims of the system change for 20 years when they basically lost their jobs with the dismantling of the state farm. But thanks to workfare, thanks to Kurzmunka, they have been able to improve household conditions and consolidate a coherent community in the town once again. So he's full of praise for Kuzmung. Market, well, finally, there is no doubt that the principle of the market remains extremely important. Some entrepreneurs have expanded their activities and their workforce. I have, however, also heard complaints of a ceiling above which Entrepreneurs who are not members of a certain magic circle shouldn't waste their time in submitting tenders. This is the closest I have come in Kishkun Holosh, little bits of gossip. It's the closest I have come to gathering any evidence to support 
Balint Modular's diagnosis of a mafia state. I cannot support that notion with my own observations, but people talk about a ceiling above which no local entrepreneurs in a place like Kishkun Holosh should waste their time with trying to get a contract from the state because that's controlled by higher forces. Let me just add a word briefly about the major foreign investment in this county in the present century. The Mercedes-Benz factory at Ketchkemit is over 50 kilometers away, but in the absence of other opportunities, it does attract quite a lot of workers, both from Tazlar and from Kishkun Holash, commuting daily, it's about an hour and a half, commuting every day, but still quite a lot of people do it because the wages paid in Ketchkemit by the Germans are much higher than what you could hope to earn on what survives of the industrial estate in Kishkun Holash. At the same time, the people who earn those wages working for Merzi and other people who don't go there because they, they couldn't face working in a factory like that, everybody is aware, if only because of the ubiquitous Yobik posters, that the wages paid to assembly line workers at the Ketchkamek plant are barely one quarter of what a worker is paid in Stuttgart for doing exactly the same work. So there are many tensions and resentments about the way the market principle plays out inside Hungary and in the wider context of the European economy. I conclude that in comparison with the situation 10 years ago, Viktor Orban has led a successful counter movement and accomplished a significant re-embedding of the local economy in Kishkun Halash. And I haven't even mentioned the new public sector jobs that he has created recently. Through intense securitization of the nearby border, he has built new prison facilities. And this year in the spring, uh, he commanded the construction of a lazarette for COVID patients. Quite a lot of public money is flowing into Kishkun Halash. Orban's counter movement, I'm suggesting, is consistent with the original Polanyi notion of a counter movement reacting to market society. But I don't think Orban's counter movement would necessarily be congenial to Polanyi. So I come to my conclusion. And as I promised, I would like to return to a couple of details of Polanyi's biography. Towards the end of his life, when he was already seriously ill, he returned to Budapest for the first time in more than four decades. He lectured to socialist intellectuals and argued with old comrades about the nature of the revolution in 1919. With the events of 1956 still quite a fresh memory in 1963, his last visit, Polanyi nonetheless expressed expressed his optimism for the future of socialism under Janusz Kaber. He and his wife devoted a lot of their time in these years in Canada, where they were living. They spent a lot of time and energy translating into English the poems and prose texts by left-leaning writers who are generally referred to as populist in Hungarian, Nepi. Polanyi was especially attracted to the evocative poetry of Ferenc Juhasz, of peasant progeny. Though his own social background could hardly differ more, Karl Polanyi identified passionately with ordinary people, ordinary Hungarian folk. He saw no contradiction between this populist sympathy and his commitment to a democratic socialist future for the country. Contrast this type of populism with the illiberalism espoused by Hungary's present prime minister. I think Viktor Orban can claim much credit for the way in which, through many years of dedicated organizational effort, he established his party across the nation to lay the foundations for the near monopoly that it enjoys nowadays in parliamentary elections of course, with the exception of Budapest, Seged and a few other places. Tazla and Kishkun Halash did not elect Fidesz mayors until 2014, but the party was dominant in both of these settlements much earlier. 
this was not preordained 30 years ago. It didn't have to play out like this, in my view. In 1990, Fides was barely recognized in Kishkun Halash. It cooperated with the SDS, with the main liberal party in that first post-socialist election. And this alliance, SDS and Fides together, attracted more votes than any other grouping in the first free elections after socialism. But as far as I have been able to ascertain, the SDS never took places like Holosh seriously. No senior liberal politician ever bothered to campaign there. The SDS mayor, who remained in office until 2002, only managed to do so by distancing himself from his party, from the intellectual elites in the capital. Fides, in contrast, from the beginning, took organization at the grassroots seriously. Even in 1990, a young activist from Ketchkemit called Tamash Deutsch was sent out on the campaign trail around the smaller towns of Bach Kishkun, including Kishkun Hajj. Viktor Orban himself had a rather close relationship with a Tazlar entrepreneur for much of the 1990s. It is alleged that very significant financial resources flowed to Orban's party by a gentleman who was known as the, the king of tobacco for the first half of the 1990s when he controlled about half of the tobacco market, at least in southern Hungary. But I have no time to go into the details now. Certainly, Viktor Orban has continued to visit this area, even in the new century. I have been reliably informed that he especially enjoys salami made from the meat of the pure breed of Hungarian Sulke Marta, um, which a few people uh, cultivate are very proud of in this region. The local mayors and the member of parliament are loyal to their leadership. Citizens who may disapprove of much of what the government does and may even deplore the high temperature that is maintained in the media, even they appreciate the stability that they have enjoyed for the last decade compared to the chaos they experienced before 2010. The external analyst may insist that this is based on the deception, that government policies do not in fact serve the interests of ordinary villagers and small town dwellers, but that is an issue that I cannot probe further today. I would like to leave it at that for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I uh, just want to check, do you hear me now if I'm leaving the microphone on the table? I would prefer you to speak a little bit louder. Then I, uh, I take the microphone. It's better, better now. Okay, better. good. Because